Uh, good afternoon. I'm happy to be here to tell you a little bit about uh, what we've been doing with, uh, with NRGene around uh, sequencing multiple uh, wheat genomes uh, and ultimately to start getting at understanding of the pan genome of wheat. So first I want to remind everyone, I'm a, I'm a plant breeder at the University of Saskatchewan, so uh, the programs in, in Canada that we have uh, in the public sector that are, that are breeding wheat are, are big users of, of marker-assisted selection and, and genomic selection. And uh, so I've always been interested in, in wheat genome sequencing and, and how that can be applied to our, our breeding program. Um, obviously, a, a genome sequence is an unlimited source of DNA markers that, that we have access to. Um, it can reduce the time and improve the success of, of QTL mapping and understanding, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, traits that are under complex genetic control. Um, most breeders that I talk to uh, when we're talking about utilizing genome sequences feel that candidate genes for traits, so perfect markers, would, would be ultimately where we'd like to be. Um, and discovery and exploitation of new alleles, particularly uh, in wild germplasm that we would like to integress into our breeding program um, to in, uh, improve um, allele diversity. So yes, we have a wheat genome sequence. Uh, um, the IWGSE uh, announced that this PAG, I'm sure most of you were in that session, that uh, they've released the completed sequence of, of, of Chinese spring. And that will be a truly a gold standard for the wheat community. It's, it's highly contiguous. Um, we've been working within the IWGSC to, to validate the assembly, and it looks just absolutely fantastic. And uh, I'd like to shout out to the IWGSC and congratulate them on this major accomplishment. So now we have to start thinking about many wheat genomes, and I know Energene has been busy over the last year uh, working with a number of partners to, um, to assemble uh, diploid, tetraploid, and, and, and several hexaploid uh, wheat species. And, and one thing that's always impressed me when I see the statistics is, is the L and N50s where, you know, we're, we're having uh, quite nice assemblies with uh, L50s in the range of, of six megabases with the um, Genome Magic or uh, De Novo Magic, <laughs> pardon me, uh, uh, version two, and and now with version three where we're adding 10 10x data, uh, you can see that under the AK58 uh, that was produced by China, where uh, we're seeing fantastic uh, L50s in, in the range of 30 megabases. So we're now moving into multiple genomes, and, and, and this really means that we can start thinking about a post-genome sequence era. Um, now that we have the Chinese spring gold standard, we have technologies that we can use to assemble multiple genomes. Um, we now have to start thinking of, of what we can do moving forward. So to that end, uh, the WEED initiative um, planned a, a meeting in, in Cambridge earlier this year and, and, and where we brought together a group of, of wheat genomics uh, breeder, scientists, breeders, users, uh, bioinformaticians to, to really start brainstorming about where we can go next in, in, in wheat genomics given um, the availability of the Chinese spring uh, sequence. We thought starting to characterize the corn pan genomes would be good. We could probably do that, let's say, with 10 genomes. It's just uh, uh, a round number, I suppose. 100 genomes to start looking at structural and presence-absence variation. Ultimately, it would be nice to get to 1,000 genomes and, and really start defining haplotypes. And, and, and many of us, including um, ourselves in Saskatoon, have been doing a lot of exome sequencing, RNA sequencing, uh, um, to discover SNPs and, and, and alleles that are important to us. So obviously when we're doing these sequences, uh, sequencing, um, um, there's decreasing sequence contiguity, um, but this is why we want to do 10 good high quality genomes so that we can then start anchoring um, some of these other information uh, to those haplotypes. So the need for a pan genome, obviously a single reference is not representative of the uh, genetic diversity that is available in wheat. Um, there is growing evidence of the role of copy number variation and presence-absence uh, diversity in phenotypic expression of traits. We see that in our own program. So really getting at the, the unique um, uh, genes 
uh, within cultivars is something that we're really interested in, as well as the dispensable genome. Um, so obviously there's a need to develop and uh, complete an atlas of the gene content of wheat, really to support biology and breeding. So as part of the WEED initiative, uh, we decided to start the uh, 10 Genomes Project, uh, really with the goal of, of beginning to characterize presence absence variation, um, structural variation, and copy number variation in wheat. Um, and we decided to uh, pool the community, and, and we were able to, uh, to come together as a community and, and decide on 10 cultivars that are um, uh, geographically distributed in, in major breeding centers. Um, and, and pull together varieties to sequence using the NR gene technology uh, and assemblers um, to, to start looking at the pan genome. So from the Canadian context, we sequence two varieties, and I'll, I'll update you on those. Uh, we have one variety from the U.S. that's already been sequenced, uh, German winter wheat variety Julius, uh, Arena, a Swiss uh, winter wheat variety, um, and the Australians um, will hopefully be coming to the table with, uh, with two cultivars and, and, and we have uh, some Chinese varieties uh, as well. And working with the Earlham Institute, obviously they've done a lot of sequencing and, and assembly uh, of, of many wheat varieties. Uh, we'll be working with them as, as, as part of this uh, to integrate that data uh, into the NR gene ref seq uh, of these 10 uh, to really do a, a, a nice job at, at defining the pan genome. So I'll just walk you through how we're uh, um, doing the NR gene ref seq assemblies. That's what I'll refer to them. Uh, we're basically generating 200x paired end and make pair data, uh, assembling that using NR genes de novo magic software. Um, some bioinformatics steps to, um, to, to break some chimeric scaffolds. Um, with any assembler, you tend to see um, uh, some chimeric scaffolds creeping into the assemblies. We can break those. Uh, we're anchoring those using and scaffolding using high C data. Uh, and obviously, uh, supporting um, uh, annotations of these uh, assemblies uh, using standardized tissues and treatments uh, to conduct RNA-seq. Uh, analyses um, so we have confidence in our annotations. So this is where we are uh, in terms of progress. So uh, CDC Landmark and CD, uh, CDC Stanley, uh, we're just at the stage now where we're generating the RNA-seq data. Uh, we have high C assemblies of those two cultivars. Uh, Jagger, uh, we have an assembly as well, um, but we don't have the high C data uh, quite yet. Uh, and just last week, we received the, the assembly of the German cultivar uh, Julius. So we're, we're, we're getting to be in a good position to actually start uh, doing comparative analyses of these genomes um, um, to help define the pan genome. Um, so just some statistics on, on, on CDC Landmark and, and, and Stanley. We have quite good contiguous assemblies. Um, we estimate that about 94% uh, of the assembly is actually ordered and, and, and anchored uh, of those two. Um, we want to go back now and use the uh, de novo magic 3 um, and generating 10x data. Uh, we were quite impressed with the, uh, with the increase in the uh, scaffold N50s. Um, so we're just in the process of, of, of doing that. We've generated the data and, and redoing the assemblies uh, as we speak. Um, with the assemblies, we've, we've started to do some real preliminary analyses just to get our head, head around what we're dealing with, and, and this is just an all-by-all -all comparison um, looking at SMP variants, and, and we're just finding millions of variants um, uh, across all of the chromosomes um, that we can use to start, start supporting haplotype discovery. Uh, even even in the three lines that that, that we've uh, generated sequence for uh, so far, so so the data looks quite quite good, uh, and and we're already using some of the SMP information in our breeding programs, and I'll show an example of that later. So we wanted to have a look at the at the gene space. We don't have, as I said earlier, annotations of, of Jagger, Stanley, and Landmark, but um, we we do have the uh, Chinese Spring uh, Wheat Survey sequence gene models that we could look at. Uh, we map those to the uh, uh, three genomes of and and then look to see what was common and 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 basically what was unique. 
and what we find is that about 90 percent of the uh, WSS uh, gene models are, are present in, or genes are present in, uh, in all the cultivars and interestingly enough uh, Chinese spring um, has, has about 3 percent of the genes that are, that are unique to it. We can't find them in, in Jagger, Stanley or Landmark but um, as we start annotating these other genomes we'll have a better sense. We expect this to, uh, to bump up quite a bit. Um, this is actually some, supported by some comparative uh, genomic hybridization studies that we did way back with, with Ed Akinoff and, and others um, where we were look, when we were developing the, uh, uh, the exome capture for wheat we uh, did some comparative genomic hybridization studies and found that 7 percent of the captured genes were showing uh, um, um, some variation in copy number in the four cultivars that we analyzed. So, so that 10 percent and more probably is a, is a good number for, for a glimpse into, into the uh, gene um, vari copy number variation. So big deal as a breeder, I ask myself that a lot. Uh, obviously there has to be application. Um, it's, it's obviously very important to, to our funders uh, of our breeding program. Um, so the lines that we selected for, for sequencing, we spent a fair bit of time uh, analyzing our, our germplasm collections to, um, to identify lines that represented the allelic diversity uh, within our program, that represented founders or founder alleles. Um, um, obviously we wanted to also focus on lines that, that had high priority genes that are important to breeding programs. Um, and, and, and the last criteria was we really didn't want any IP uh, concerns around uh, what we were sequencing so that we could share the seed, we could share the information uh, as quickly as possible. So the two that we selected were, were CDC Stanley and, and, and CDC Landmark. Uh, CDC Stanley is, is interesting because it carries the uh, VPM1 introgression from uh, uh, Ventricosa, so we were interested in that. It has some useful alleles that we're using in the breeding program. And, and CDC Landmark expresses uh, a resistance to the wheat stem softfly, and, and here you can see the, uh, the larvae of that particular insect girdling away through hollowed stem varieties causing significant damage. Um, but varieties that have a solid stem with pith um, will provide mechanical resistance to, uh, to, uh, to that larvae from girdling. So we've already started to look within the assemblies and, and we can find the 2N translocation uh, uh, on the long arm of chromosome 2A. It's quite easy to do uh, now that we have these assemblies. We just, just align them and, and we can see there's about a 20 megabase um, uh, translocation on, on the short arm of chromosome 2A. Um, and, and actually Jesse Poland, um, who, who sequenced Jagger, that line also carries the uh, 2N translocation and he did independent uh, uh, analysis and, and, and estimated uh, a 21 megabase pair uh, uh, translocation. So we're excited about this one. It has some some useful genes, um, uh, particularly for wheat blast, a, an emerging um, disease that, that, that um, certainly on plant breeders' minds uh, in many parts of the world. Um, in terms of CDC Landmark, as I said earlier, it expresses pith in the stems now, but what's interesting about Landmark is the pith expression is, is quite variable depending on the environment that, that, that you grow the variety. And so it can range from something that's actually quite hollow, like you see on the left part of the screen, uh, to something that's very solid. And uh, this can be frustrating for breeders when they're making selections. Uh, so um, you, you, you're not actually sure if, you're, uh, uh, if, if the gene is, is present or not. So um, we, we've, we've been spending a lot of time um, trying to clone this gene so that we can understand its regulation and, and perhaps uh, why it's being suppressed in, in, in some environments. So we've done a lot of genetic mapping in a, in, in, in a whole bunch of, of mapping populations and I'll just summarize it here. Um, that when, when we map the, uh, the SST1, the solid stem gene, um, we can anchor it to a 1.1 megabase pair interval on, on chromosome 3B. So we compare it to the Chinese spring assembly, Stanley and Landmark, um, 
we saw something interesting. The sizes were different. Um, CDC Landmark, which is solid stem and carrying the gene, um, the assembly was, was larger in this interval by about uh, 0.7 megabases. So we wanted to have a closer look at that. Um, and, and so when we compared to the Svevo, the Zavitan, uh, CDC Stanley uh, sequences, we saw there were two um, insertions in the SST1 interval of CDC landmark, one about 180 KB and another at about 500 KB. So we got to thinking to ourselves, we, we really have to look at this interval because obviously um, it could contain genes which are, are in fact responsible for the phenotype. So we decided to have a closer look at the actual contexts um, that uh, were part of the scaffold that, that we identified for the SST1 interval and, and started to try to validate if these, these insertions were real. And, and what we found is um, uh, that the one insertion, uh, the one on your right, it, uh, the larger one, um, when we mapped some of the transcriptome data that we had, um, those transcripts were actually mapping to 3A of, of, of Chinese spring. So, so perhaps this is a, is a chimeric scaffold that, that we missed in some of our, uh, of our early um, um, as steps prior to the assembly. Um, the second, the smaller of the interval, is real. We were able to confirm that using multiple PCR tests. And there are genes uh, within this interval that are differentially regulated between hollow and, and solid stemmed uh, uh, genotypes. So we're focusing on these as, as, as putative candidates uh, in addition to some other in interesting genes that are just flanking uh, th this uh, 180 KB insertion uh, in CDC landmark. So what are our next steps? Well, we want to complete the uh, 10 hexaploid wheat references using the uh, NR gene de novo magic 3 uh, version, so adding uh, the 30x coverage of, uh, of 10x data, obviously generating the RNA-seq data to support annotation of these unique or dispensable genes that we're identifying, um, and then ultimately generate a wheat pangenome reference uh, so that we can better characterize the presence-absence structural and copy number variation. And in our own program, we're already um, working to, to integrate low coverage sequence data uh, to, to better characterize most of the diversity in our breeding program, including interesting uh, wild relatives uh, um, uh, that we've been crossing with uh, to introduce uh, useful phenotypic variation. So with that, I'd like to, uh, to end my talk. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, all of the uh, uh, partners that, that are part of the 10 Genome Project, uh, in particular, Neil Stein, Jesse Poland, and uh, B. Keller, Asif Distefeld, and, and Gary Buhlmauer who have sort of been pushing um, uh, me on this to move it forward. Um, obviously, thanking uh, NR Gene, it's just been a fantastic relationship where the data is, sure does not take very long to come back. Uh, once it hits the assembly pipeline, and we're very grateful for that. It's moving our science forward. Um, and I'd, I'd also like to acknowledge my, my colleagues at the University of Saskatchewan, Global Institute for Food Security. Um, the scientists at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada provided most of the mapping populations and, and a lot of the phenotypic information um, that we've been using to, to characterize our material. National Research Council, uh, in particular Satish, uh, who's uh, working with me now to sequence these additional cultivars with low coverage, and Alvero for generating such fantastic uh, sequence information. And I, I would be remiss not to thank uh, my funders, particularly Genome Canada and Genome Prairie, who are just absolute um, fantastic uh, funders and work uh, closely with us to make sure we can get the good work done. Um, as well as the Western Grains Research Foundation and, and, and others here on the slide. So with that, I'll, I'll end my talk and entertain any questions. Mm -hmm.